After having thus committed murder, we began to be afraid of each other. We each of us feared that on going to sleep we should be dispatched by the others. We were always in a state of dreadful alarm. In today's episode, we will hear a sordid tale of convicts and cannibals, mind games and murder as we join a group of escaped prisoners on a hellish journey towards their eventual doom. Welcome to Ratbags and Roustabouts, the place where we tell those extraordinary stories of ordinary people who never made it to the history books. I'm your host, Marianne Langford. There's a bit of a story behind how I came across the topic for today's episode. Back in episode 6, Gaffs at the Gallows, we heard a bit about the history of capital punishment in Australia. While researching that, I came across two men who were sentenced to death simply for being illegally at large while under sentence of transportation. This seemed like a pretty harsh punishment for what sounded like a fairly minor crime. As I started digging into it, I found references to this particular death sentence all over the place, in speeches given mainly by criminologists and lawyers who were speaking in support of Australia's historical abolition of the death penalty. Basically, in the speech, they would talk a bit about the history of capital punishment in Australia and would then include the line, and there was even one who was executed for being illegally at large. It always made it sound like this huge travesty of justice, so obviously I had to find out the whole story. Turns out, as with most things, it wasn't that simple. Firstly, all of these speeches were factually incorrect because they all said it was just one person, while in fact it was two who were officially executed for the crime of being illegally at large. And secondly, the line, I think, insinuates that not being where they were supposed to be was their only crime. And boy oh boy folks, that could not be further from the truth. So let's jump down this particular historical rabbit hole together as I tell you the incredible, dark and gruesome story. I actually really hope that someone someday turns this into a creepy miniseries or something because it has it all. Paranoia, a fight for survival, murder and that most horrible of all horrible crimes, cannibalism. But I'm getting ahead of myself as usual. First, let's head to Macquarie Harbour, Van Diemen's Land in 1830 as we unpick the truth behind that throwaway line. Macquarie Harbour was a penal settlement in the west of Van Diemen's Land that operated from 1822 to 1833. It was basically the precursor to the more well-known Port Arthur. It was a remote, harsh place, mainly used for re-offenders, essentially convicts who'd committed subsequent crimes after they'd already been transported out to New South Wales. Owing to its remoteness, convicts nicknamed it Pluto's Land, not after the planet, which hadn't yet been discovered, but after the god of the underworld. These were dark times, so I guess they needed dark names. The small opening to the harbour, just 120 metres across, was and still is known as Hell's Gates, and it gives you a little indication of what the convicts faced there. Now, the weather out there is pretty tempestuous. It's freezing, it rains a lot of the time, and you also get the roaring 40s blowing across. Just to give you an example of how strong that wind really is... It would take ships about four weeks to sail from Hobart around to Macquarie Harbour, which was going against the wind. But the return trip going with the wind would take as little as four days. Because of these conditions, they tried and failed to grow very much food there, apart from the odd spud. So most of their provisions had to be brought by ship. This meant, as well as being constantly wet and freezing, prisoners suffered from hunger, malnutrition and scurvy. The main work the convicts were given was cutting timber, hue and pine, which was wanted for shipbuilding. 
it was unforgiving, back-breaking work, made more difficult by the lack of food. Punishments were harsh too. They were routinely lashed and put into solitary confinement. And the solitary confinement cells were not even big enough to lie out flat in, and they were absolutely pitch black. There was no light whatsoever getting in. If a convict failed to answer the roll call each morning, they were flogged. If they made any kind of small infractions such as committing a nuisance or destroying his shirt, they were flogged. And in this penal station, lashes were delivered with a special cat and nine tails that was called the Macquarie Cat. It had nine strands, each with knots tied along it, but added to the knots were these small pieces of metal, just in case it wasn't already brutal enough. It wasn't unheard of for prisoners to commit crimes such as murder just so that they would be executed because death was preferable to living in this hell on earth. But some of the convicts thought there must be another option. Escape. This was no easy feat. It was about 170 kilometres from Macquarie Harbour to Hobart as the crow flies. In those days, everyone sailed between the two settlements. There was no real overland route. The gates were heavily patrolled, so a sea escape was almost impossible. Instead, escapees faced a trek through some of the toughest terrain in freezing temperatures. And if they didn't have any bush survival skills, such as the ability to trap animals or understand which plants were edible, they were up the proverbial creek without a paddle. On top of this, there were some Indigenous tribes who understandably didn't take too kindly to the British colonists. This is how the terrain around the harbour was described in an article in the Hobart Mercury in 1873. Forests that are intricate beyond conception and absolutely impervious to unpractised bush travellers grow round most parts of it and extend inland for many miles, thus cutting off all hope of successful escape from it in a landward direction, while the chances of getting away by sea were nearly as hopeless. Still, Macquarie Harbour was horrible enough for many to try to get away regardless. One man who did manage to escape from it was Matthew Brady, the bushranger who we heard about back in the first ever episode of Ratbags. In fact, part of his ongoing fight with Governor George Arthur involved Brady calling on the Governor to shut down this inhumane, miserable place. Brady had been in a group of 14 convicts who escaped Macquarie Harbour by boat in 1824. But, as I've said, a sea escape was almost impossible and most escape attempts went by land. Another fairly well-known convict who escaped this way not once but twice was Alexander Pierce. And he may have been the inspiration for the group of escapees who we're talking about in this episode who made their escape by land in September 1830. There were five of them. Edward Broughton, known as Ned, Matthew McAvoy, sometimes referred to as McElboy, Patrick Fagan, William Coventry, and Richard Hutchinson, who was also known as Up and Down Dick, apparently thus named because he was quite tall for those times, standing five foot eight. That's about 172 centimetres. And by the way, here's a tip. Don't try Googling up and down dick. It will not end well for you. Anyway, five of them escaped, but only two of them, Broughton and McAvoy, were found when they turned themselves in at Maguire's Marshes over 100 kilometres from Macquarie Harbour. In November 1830, a story appeared in the Hobart Town Courier explaining what the men said had happened to the other three who hadn't made it. Even then, the newspaper questioned the veracity of the tale the men had told. They said that after travelling for six days they got to a river, but Hutchinson and Coventry couldn't swim, so they were left behind at that point. The three remaining men continued when about four days later, exhausted, Fagan was killed by an Indigenous group. But the news report ends with this line. These men have been closely examined in the jail by Mr Mulgrave, the Chief Police Magistrate, respecting the fate of their comrades, about which much mystery hangs. Broughton and McAvoy were charged with being illegally at large, but it seems the authorities knew there was more to it 
But what they didn't have was evidence. In those days, trials and executions were done fairly speedily, usually, but with Broughton and McAvoy, they were held in jail for almost nine months before they were finally hanged. The two men pleaded guilty to the escape charge and were sentenced to death, a very severe punishment for that crime, an opinion which I should point out people shared at the time. But the judge also encouraged the men to spend their final days giving their full confession of what really took place to their respective church ministers. Broughton was Protestant and McAvoy was Catholic, though to be honest, neither man was very religious. The judge told them any confession they made would be kept from the public until they were dead, as some kind of small comfort, presumably to spur them into telling the whole sordid truth. Both men did just that, and the confession Edward Broughton gave was later printed in pretty much every newspaper across Van Diemen's land. According to that confession, this is what really happened. Broughton began with a bit of background to his own criminal career. He ran away from home aged 11 and began a life of petty thieving. He fell in with a bad crowd, including, I quote, women of loose character. I mean, you can't trust those loose women, can you? He then became a highwayman, served two years for housebreaking, and was then arrested on another burglary charge. That one saw him sentenced to death, but it was later commuted to transportation. But by that point, His criminal habits were, I guess, ingrained in him, and once he was in Van Diemen's land, he continued thieving. It was when he was caught stealing a blanket that he found himself sent to Macquarie Harbour. While he was a habitual thief, stealing a blanket doesn't really sound like much to have deserved to be sent to such a place. There are similar stories for all five of the men who escaped. Matthew McAvoy, who was in his early 30s, had been sent to Macquarie Harbour for absconding from his master's property. Previous to this, he'd been in trouble for this and that, but none of it was particularly serious. It was things like swearing at an overseer, or one time he took his master's dogs out on a Sunday to go kangarooing without permission. Richard Hutchinson was in his 40s, was married to another convict and had four or five kids. He was sent to Macquarie Harbour for stealing a bullock. Patrick Fagan was just a young bloke. He'd been transported when he was 15 or 16, so it was only between 18 and 20 when this escape took place. And he was sent to Macquarie Harbour for stealing money. And William Coventry, who was almost 60 years old, had actually had a farm and was doing well until he stole three bullocks from another property when the farmer died. None of these crimes were life-shattering, none were violent, but that is how this unlikely bunch of men ended up together in Macquarie Harbour and how they ended up deciding to try their luck in the near-impenetrable forest rather than stay in the hellish penal settlement. Hunger can drive you to all kinds of things. They had probably already been starving as convicts and once they were on the run, things only got worse. There was no food. They had an almost 200-kilometre trek ahead of them. Desperate times called for desperate measures. Some years before, Alexander Pierce, who I mentioned earlier, had made the same trek through the same bush and had survived by killing and eating his fellow escapees. The men decided on a similar course of action. They made a plan to kill Richard Hutchinson and eat him. While the clueless Hutchinson slept, the others drew lots to see who would murder him. Broughton drew the short straw. He took up the axe and brought it down on Hutchinson's head, killing him mercifully quickly. In his confession, he explained what they did next. He was cut to pieces, and with the exception of the intestines, hands, feet and head, the body was carried with us. We lived some days upon his flesh. We ate it heartily. But it wasn't long until the group began to wonder who would be next. Being stuck in the middle of nowhere and suspecting that your mates want to eat you is a pretty good incentive to not sleep. That's what happened. The group of now four men began to be suspicious of each other. 
watching each other like hawks, keeping an eye on every weapon, afraid to close their eyes for even a minute. Paranoia set in big time. In his confession, Broughton said, After having thus committed murder, we began to be afraid of each other. One night I woke Fagan and told him to watch while I slept, and I would watch while he slept, for I feared that I should be murdered. We each of us feared that on going to sleep we should be dispatched by the others. We were always in a state of dreadful alarm. The problem is that once those goalposts have been moved, it's hard to move them back. Once the men had turned to cannibalism, normal rules had gone out the window. And I guess they thought as long as someone else was in everyone's sights, it meant they, at least for the moment, were safe. That's why all eyes then turned towards Coventry. William Coventry, described in his convict records as being five foot three with greying hair and brown eyes, was the oldest of the group. Fagan, McAvoy and Broughton whispered among themselves and decided he would be next. But Broughton knew he was the only one in the group who had actually committed murder, which put an instant sentence of death over his head. So at this point, he refused to do it again, arguing that the other two should do it between them so that all three of them were in the same position. And look, he made a fair point. But it turns out he was better at the task than McAvoy and Fagan, because when they went to actually do the murderous deed, they really ballsed it up. I assume the three of them thought Coventry is old, he'll be easy to kill. So one night Coventry is cutting wood for the fire. Fagan sneaks up behind him with the axe. But Coventry sees him coming. Fagan brings the axe down, but Coventry has turned at the last moment. The blow strikes him just above the eye, but it doesn't kill him. Coventry begins begging for mercy. Broughton and McAvoy then have to run in, and the three of them overpower poor old Coventry and finish him off. In the confession, Broughton doesn't go into details over how Coventry dies, but I think reading between the lines, it was a difficult death. To paraphrase James Bond in Casino Royale, Coventry made them feel it. But once Coventry was dead, they wasted no time in cutting him up and tucking in. I think the most disturbing part of the murder of William Coventry is this line in the confession. Broughton said, We lived upon his body for some days. We were not starving when we killed Coventry. We had only consumed the remains of Hutchinson the same day. We were not at all sparing of the food we obtained from the bodies of our companions. We ate it as if we had abundance. If we had been sparing of it, the one would have been sufficient for us. I think this more than anything else is the part of the story that I find hard to get my head around. Psychologists have categorised three types of cannibalism. There's ritual cannibalism, which has been found through history in some tribes around the world where, for example, they consume part of a loved one when they die so that the person's spirit can live on in them. Then there's survival cannibalism. An example of this is seen in the story of the Uruguay rugby team whose plane crashed in the Andes in 1972 and they had to eat those who had died in order to survive. Then there's pathological cannibalism. An example of this would be serial killer Jeffrey Dahmer, who cannibalised parts of his victims. These stories of convicts and bushrangers in the early history of the British settlement in Australia often begin as survival cannibalism, but they seem to start to straddle that line between survival and pathological. And look, I reckon most of us can understand being in a situation where you're starving and you're fighting to survive and we can reconcile with people in that position eating human flesh because they have no other choice. But you'd surely make it last, eat the bare minimum and continue to try to find some non-human food once you'd regained your strength. But not these blokes. They're tucking into poor old Hutchinson. They're cooking up Coventry. And for what? All it's doing is making them more suspicious of each other, more paranoid, more fearful that they might be next. A similar thing happened with Alexander Pierce. In his story, the group of escapees had begun by drawing lots to see who would be killed for food and ended with a standoff between the last two men to see who would kill who. However, it was possible not to descend into a murderous rampage. 
We saw this with Thomas Jeffries, who we heard about in episode two, where his group decided whoever fell asleep first would be killed and eaten. But after that, the remaining two men continued to travel together without this level of suspicion and paranoia. After Coventry was dead, it left three of them, Broughton, McAvoy and Fagan. They were more paranoid now than ever. Broughton said in his confession, We now became daily more afraid of each other. We could not sleep or rest. I used to carry the axe of a day, and if I could, I used to lay it under my head of a night, forgetting that they had knives and razors. Then one night, Broughton looks up to see McAvoy standing at the fire, looking crazed and wild. He asked Broughton to go with him into the bush. They have a few snares and he thought he saw a kangaroo track down there. Maybe they could set a few snares and catch a kangaroo. Broughton goes with him, believing that's all he intends to do. But McAvoy does not take the snares with them. Broughton is carrying the axe, and after they'd walked a while, McAvoy lays down on the ground and tells Broughton to sit a moment to rest. Broughton, suspicious of McAvoy, decides to throw the axe on the ground out of reach of McAvoy so that if he tries anything, Broughton can grab it first. He's convinced that McAvoy is planning to kill him, and he knows that McAvoy is the stronger of the two. That's when, instead, McAvoy begins talking about Fagan. Fagan is young and foolish, he says. He goes on saying, if we're caught, he's bound to talk. The only way to prevent this is to kill him now. But Broughton won't agree to it. McAvoy continues his pitch. He's sure Fagan will confess to everything. But McAvoy and Broughton both know how to hold their tongues. McAvoy has thought it all through. They can say they left the other three at Gordon's River because none of them could swim. Then they probably just perished in the bush. The worst that will happen to us, he tells Broughton, is we get sent to Norfolk Island. But Broughton says Fagan is known to be a very good swimmer and no one will believe the story. They agree not to kill him and they go back to camp. But the seeds of doubt have been sown. When Broughton and McAvoy reach the camp, Fagan is by the fire warming his feet. Broughton throws the axe down and Fagan asks, Have you put any snares down, Ned? He answers no. Broughton sits next to Fagan while McAvoy sits next to the axe. McAvoy is staring at Broughton and Broughton is desperate to tell Fagan what McAvoy said on their walk, but he can't. It's an uncomfortable evening and eventually the men lie down to sleep. Then. Just as Broughton is dozing, he hears a blood-curdling scream coming from Fagan. He jumps up. There is blood pouring from a wound on Fagan's head, and McAvoy is standing over him holding the axe. Broughton screams at McAvoy, You murdering rascal, you bloodthirsty wretch! What have you done? McAvoy tells him this is going to save us both. Then he brings the axe down on Fagan's head a second time. Fagan is still alive, but he's not in a good way. He groans and then McAvoy grabs a razor and he slits Fagan's throat. Fagan is dead. Broughton and McAvoy spare no time in stripping him naked and in doing so they begin to have an argument over Fagan's red shirt, which they'd stolen from Bradshaw, one of the overseers at Macquarie Harbour. Incidentally, Bradshaw had been one of the few people there who'd shown any kind of kindness to Broughton, and in return, Broughton had once tried to have a tree fall on him and had also stolen clothes and food from him before their escape. Anyway, once they'd stripped Fagan, they cut off his head, hands and feet, and roasted the rest of him. Broughton explained that this made him lighter to carry and last longer. Two days later, they heard some wild dogs. The dogs had cornered a kangaroo, so the men took the dead roo and threw away the remainder of Fagan. And another two days after that, their trek through the wilderness was over. They'd reached a settlement and they gave themselves up. That's when they gave their story of Fagan being killed by a group of Indigenous people and Hutchinson and Coventry not being able to swim 
It's also when authorities began to become suspicious of the tale. The court decision didn't come until halfway through the following year. In the intervening months, the church ministers did all they could to urge Broughton and McAvoy to confess to the truth of what had taken place in the Tasmanian wilderness. They wouldn't admit to anything other than their original story, and Broughton in particular took every opportunity to insult the Reverend William Bedford and tell him what he thought of the church. The pair had pleaded guilty to being illegally at large, presumably thinking, as they'd said previously, that the worst that would happen to them would be that they'd be sent to Norfolk Island. It wasn't until they were told they had been sentenced to death, as well as being made to witness the execution of another man three days before their own deaths were to take place, that the men finally realised there was no point keeping quiet any longer. And that's when their confessions were made. So, on August 5th, 1831, almost a year after their escape from Macquarie Harbour, Edward Broughton and Matthew McAvoy were executed in Hobart officially for the crime of being at large, unofficially for murder and cannibalism. The whole episode does raise some legal questions, and to be fair, it did raise the same questions at that time. In an article in the Colonial Times a couple of weeks after the execution, the newspaper talks about the difference between the crime the men were convicted of and the crimes they later confessed to. Supposing, then, McAvoy and Broughton had been tried and convicted of the murders of which they owned themselves the perpetrators instead of the mere escape from Macquarie Harbour, would their fate have at all exceeded in severity that which befell them? We all know that the answer must be in the negative. And where, then, let us ask, is the man who will pretend to say that the two offences bear the least proportion to each other in a moral degree of turpitude? Who, in a word, will rank a murderer and a mere runaway from a prison alike in the grades of crime? It then talks about the importance of being considered innocent until proven guilty and says the two men in question were not proven guilty of murder. It then says this, We ought still to remember that legally they stand before us only as runaways and that in this light only, therefore, ought their late punishment to be considered. It is true, and it is also interesting, that 200 years ago the same questions were being asked and the same standards were expected of the judicial system as we expect today. It does seem, though, that the authorities tried their damnedest to get Broughton and McAvoy to confess over these intervening months between their capture and their executions. And eventually they gave up and just gave them the sentence they knew that they deserved for a crime which really didn't warrant it. But the same Colonial Times article then raised the question of what use Macquarie Harbour was anyway, if all it was doing was producing men so desperate that they would kill and eat their fellow convicts just to get away from it. It said this, Can Macquarie Harbour produce one single instance among the thousands who have been sent there where the slightest reformation has been produced? Nay, on the contrary, have not most who have been transported thither been sunk ten times deeper in crime by the very means that have been taken to produce their amendment? And look, it's a valid point. In his book, A Compulsion to Kill, Robert Cox seemed to blame the depravity these men sunk to all on Broughton as he was the closest to a career criminal of the group. But I just don't think that's fair. Broughton wasn't a violent offender. He hadn't done anything worse than any of the rest of them. He was in Macquarie Harbour for stealing a blanket, for God's sake. I think a better explanation is that something about the place itself created criminals. Instead of reforming prisoners, it turned them into men willing to become monsters if it got them food or warmth or freedom. The same article says something similar. The unvarying life of misery that is the lot of one and all who are transported to Macquarie Harbour not only is found to fail in producing the legitimate object of all punishments, but what is infinitely worse has been proved over and over again to have been the direct origin of crime of the darkest dye.
of all the convicts who passed through Macquarie Harbour, only 3% had committed a violent crime. Yet you have these horrendous stories of violence and degradation coming out of the penal station. Like one man who caught a snake and when he refused to give it to his friend, his friend stabbed him in the face, throat and heart before disemboweling him and cutting off his genitals. Or another prisoner who got irritated by a man standing in front of him, so he drove his axe into the guy's head. With the escapees we heard about today, we can see a group mentality at play. It begins as a question of survival. At first, that survival is merely to avoid starvation, but then it's a psychological game, kill or be killed. That could explain why they murdered each other so rapidly, why they weren't even hungry again before they killed and cooked the next victim. In carving them up and roasting the meat, they were in a way justifying the murder, because then it's murder out of necessity, it's murder for a reason, it isn't just senseless. Except, of course, it is. And we know that. And they also knew that then. Macquarie Harbour was arguably the real villain of this piece, and it also received its sentence of death. In 1833, two years after Broughton and McAvoy were executed, the penal settlement was shut down in favour of Port Arthur. Little comfort for those who had passed through the place in the previous 11 years. Little comfort too for Edward Broughton and Matthew McAvoy, who are now a footnote in Australia's history as the two men who were executed for being illegally at large, a seemingly simple phrase that was not actually that simple at all. Well, that's it for another episode of Ratbags and Rastabouts. It's been quite the tale of horror that we've heard today. I will be back in a fortnight's time with another story for you. In the meantime, as always, you can head to the website ratbagsandroustabouts.com to read all the show notes, to listen to any of the past episodes, or to fill out the contact form if you have any burning questions or stories to tell. And in the show notes for today's episode, you can also read an extra little nugget about Alexander Pierce, who was briefly mentioned in this episode, and how he earned his place as possibly Australia's worst cannibal killer. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed hearing all about the murderers and cannibals from today's episode. In a way, it's actually a sad story, and I reckon like me, you'll probably feel quite sorry for all of them. Anyway, make sure you join me again in two weeks' time for more stories about those commoners mark ratbags and roustabouts from our past who still have incredible tales to tell. 